take a normal size comfortable breath in. So we're not doing deep breathing here. Uh, normal size breath in through the nose as if you were smelling a flower for four seconds. And then, you know, breathing out as if you are blowing out a candle on a cake for six seconds. And this is for adults. Um, the, the timing is going to be different yeah, right. for kids. But for adults, you know, four seconds in, six seconds out. That's the simplest thing, you know, breathe like that for, you know, three minutes or even taking, you know, 10 breaths uh, like this is going to make a really big difference in the moment. Ideally, the person would also have access to an HRV reader uh, and could actually get some data and figure out a their own personal resonance frequency breathing rate. You know, that's four, four in, six out is kind of you know, an average one size fits all. Uh, it's nicer if someone can figure out their own uh, personal resonance frequency breathing rate because it could be a little higher or a little lower than six. The reader uh, or the software to go with it is not available four in, six out. Welcome to Neuro Noodles, Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast featuring tech legend Jay Gunkelman. He is the man who has read over a half a million brain scans. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. The Neuro Noodle Podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you. Like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience, and our silver supporter, Mind Media. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neuroscience's NeuroGuide workshops in Madeira Beach, Florida. They're led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person, with the link AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. Earn up to 16 CEU hours. Sign up now at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops mind media get the latest eeg and neurofeedback technology from mindmedia.com their semi-dry sensor caps is a wonder to see and their eeg amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades their neurofeedback and qeg courses will get you up to speed in no time visit mindmedia.com now dr hazan thank you so much for uh coming on the show today Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. You are the heart rate variability guru. Two books. Let me see here. Clinical Handbook of Biofeedback, Biofeedback and Mindfulness in Everyday Life. TED Talk. I mean, you are you are it. Do you know Jay? I know Jay. Jay is it. <laughs> Somehow we've crossed paths <laughs> over the years at uh, Dozens yep. of meetings. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it's impossible not to know, Jay. Uh, I, I, I have various pictures of you, you know, hovering over groups of people. <laughs> yeah, I, pho I photobomb folks at, yep. at the meeting. So, yeah, <laughs> Those yeah, are fun. Does. So let's, let's talk breathing. How, how did you get involved? You, 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 came, you came to the country when, doctor? Um, let's see. I was 14 years old, 14 years old. You got to learn the language. Yep. Right. Which was and going through school. Not a problem. I'm 74. I still have to learn the language. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> How did you get introduced to biofeedback, neurofeedback, breathing, mindfulness? What, how did this all affect you? What, how did it start? Um, let's see. I was in graduate school. Um, I was uh, uh, interested in health psychology. Um, one of the uh, one of the practicums offered this thing called biofeedback that I knew absolutely nothing about. It was optional. Um, you know, I was busy, but I figured, you know, let's give it a try. Um, so I did. I loved it. I haven't looked back since. As Jay has always said, uh, the simplest thing that you can do, because we've uh, we've done this show through a few crisis is going on you know uh you had uh you know the, the war going on and you know people can't get access to treatment but they can figure out their breathing is it remember that jay yeah is that a simple that's the simplest thing you can do but people won't do it they'd rather you know pop a pill or or, or whatever why why is that uh you know, I wonder if it's sometimes because it feels too simple. 
Yeah. It, you know, everybody's told, oh, you know, take a deep breath, you know, just breathe, right? So it's kind of like when people uh, who resist exercise because um, walking seems like nothing. So they're, you know, but doing more intense exercise is too much time, too difficult, et cetera, right? But walking seems like it's just not enough. Um, I have a feeling if you, people have the same sense about breathing, it's just, it's just nothing. It's not enough. Um, whereas it actually makes a huge difference. So, and it's yeah. not just breathing, you know. I've been breathing all my damn life, but it's not the same as HRV. <laughs> you know, um, the, uh, your, your body has some built-in mechanisms. And uh, uh, we, I think in the U.S. we are very fortunate. Um, and uh, uh, the, the science of it in Russia was brought over to the United States. And uh, uh, Paul Lair uh, uh, interfaced with the, uh, a, a brilliant gentleman uh, at my age, I'm blocking on his name. He passed recently. Yevgeny Ostrilo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 he, he offered uh, um, a depth knowledge that would have taken halfway to forever for people to figure out uh, from, you know, from scratch again. And um, it, it was a, it was a, a, a gift of science, you know, science people, uh, kind of step past politics quite often and regardless of what might have been going on between one government and another uh, science is universal and uh, it was it was a wonderful gift of science that he brought and um, and you know Paul uh, talked and talked and taught and um, uh, the, uh, the, the the folks that picked up the technique ended up doing, you know, studies with it and, and, you know, um, and, and now you, it's hard to go to a, a biofeedback neurofeedback meeting without people discussing HRV and the interaction with the brain, you know, heart brain interactions. And, um, you, know, you measure the heartbeat and then look at the event related potential in the brain paste, you know, triggered by the, uh, the QRS complex. And, you, you you end up seeing that the two systems are interactive, so you know we uh, uh, we quite often uh, in neurofeedback or EEG think of ourselves as some weird disembodied brain, you know, and uh, uh, it it doesn't work like that. I mean, uh, uh, we're we're systems, and the systems have complex interactions, and and without. Uh, really knowing what we're doing, we've all kind of stumbled along in our life. But, you know, some simple uh, uh, tricks like HRP end up being very, very powerful. I, I told uh, Pete earlier about a friend who was going over to help the Syrian refugees in France. There's a, a, a refugee camp that's gigantic and, and, you know, people suffering. And she's got a big heart. And she came to me asking, what EEG device should I bring with me? And I, I said, well, you know, you could treat maybe a few dozen people with with EEG, you know, doing the studies and then you know, doing the sessions and so forth. But you could help hundreds, maybe thousands of people by teaching HRV. And uh, the person you teach can teach. So um, that's what she went with. And uh, it took quite a while for anybody at the refugee camp to feel open enough to actually interact with her at all. Uh, there's a lot of people that descend on refugees that are predators. Shall, shall we cut to the chase? They're predators. And uh, it, it took her interacting with one of the elders and uh, actually uh, uh, teaching him, and he realized the benefit and basically told everybody she's okay and and uh, she was flooded with people at that point and and her time there i think was very beneficial for her as well i mean the, the interpersonal uh, benefits end up benefiting everybody in the interpersonal relationship the therapist the, the client um the, the people surrounding the clients um, all, all everybody benefits so why aren't they teaching this in the schools Start it. Start them young. It's so simple. What's the? I don't understand. Wouldn't that make sense? 
Yeah, because mm-hmm. uh, we have parents. I, I help out the parents. Jay helps out the techs. And then, Dr. Hazan, you can help out er- everybody else at the advanced level. But the moms and dads out there, they got their kids, even just stressing for finals because we're in finals you know, time. Breathing before a test, I would think that would help with the test, right? It really does. Um, And somehow there is just not enough knowledge about this out there, Um, even though it's so much more easily accessible these days with technology. Um, And the science is clearly there. But most of the time when I talk about this with people who are kind of not in our too close knit community, they have no idea. I, yeah. I wonder what what is the holdup? It's not sexy, or the drug companies have more money. Uh, what's what, what's the holdup? It, we got the data that says that it works. You know, I I hate poking fingers at things while having a solution. How how do we fix this? The the lawmakers uh, put it in the in, in the in the federal school. Uh, what what do we? That'd be good. Today? I think a lot more funding needs to go towards getting the word out there uh, and making the technology accessible. Uh, I think part of the part of this is technology, even though um, what's needed is fairly simple, is still needed, um, and you know people need access to it. Uh, you know it needs to be reliable. It needs to be fairly inexpensive, and there is not a lot of options. Again, not uh, most importantly, not enough knowledge. Um, I think that's where we need to put a lot of our attention. So if you had a magic wand, doctor, how would you do it? Let's just start with the kid, moms and dads in the schools. How, how would a school day start? Or is it in the home? Or is it both? Magic wand. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, magic wand. Ideally both, right? You know, so many kids struggle with regulation. Um, and teachers and parents are going, we don't know what to do. And there, there is something very simple. The whole family can learn. The whole class can learn. All together, kids love this. You know, I've come in and done done these presentations at my kids. You know, you know, various various times in their schooling, um, and uh, young kids love it. You know, they come up with you know awesome imagery. You know, for having a balloon in their belly that they're inflating with their breath in, and you know they're deflating with their breath out. You know, they color these balloons in their mind. Sometimes, actually, on paper. You know, you know pink balloons with purple unicorns and all sorts of cool things, you know, added on to that. Um, And they love it. It's, you know, it's their balloon to carry with them. And then they can use that imagery uh, to um, help them when they're feeling dysregulated, when they're feeling overwhelmed, you know, when they're older before a test. Um, And somehow it's still not being uh, taught enough. So if I had a magic wand, this would be part of you know, initial classroom orientation for, you know, in every single classroom in every single school. Do you go through the counselors or is it part of phys ed? What do you think the easy? Probably the counselors. Yeah, probably the counselors. Yeah. I I think that kindergarten and first grade teachers who have uh, rest periods and things like that in their class, uh, uh, mindfulness, mindfulness, uh, as an approach ends up being something that works well as well. And if you start the kids out early and give them a tool to handle uh, their inner angst, uh, their inner aggression, uh, whatever uh, is off center for them, um, it, it, it gives them a tool. So, and once you've got HRV, it's not like somebody can take it away from you. You know, uh, <laughs> it's, it's it's really straightforward, and um, and it, it's something that you can do in your car when you're driving, when things are stressful. You can do it uh, at work uh, when uh, when uh, something has blown up and and you you feel stressed. You it, it, there, there's no place that you can't breathe, and there's no place that you can't have some moments of mindfulness. So um, th- th- these tools, when once once learned and once handed out early in life, I think would change the trajectory of these young kids' lives. Uh, um, it, it, you know, high school, uh, it, it's a bit, almost a bit late. Um, it, it, there's huge turmoil in, in schools and aggression and, and all of that as hormones and whatnot start to kick in later in life. If you've got the kids trained up in these techniques early in life, 
you avoid a lot of the uh, stress-related acting out that uh, uh, may end up uh, being triggered by hormones and uh, social uh, difficulties that start to develop as people start to reach out socially. And uh, we have to start early. And and we we can't wait for oh well it's a it's a course in your junior college <laughs> sorry it's a bit late you know um, uh, the uh, there's shootings and stabbings and things that happen because of people's being stressed out and anxious and acting out and a lot of that would be avoided so uh, it, it's a shame that it's not uh, instituted. Uh, basically by, from top down within school systems. Well, Seaburn Fisher always says that tra- trauma in your early youth, you know, affects you later in life. It's almost like preschool or even younger to to learn how to do it, to set you off in a better path. And you have an app, right? Um, I do. Um, so Optimal HRV um, is uh, designed specifically uh, to help uh, walk people through um, the beginning, uh, you know, middle end of HRV training from um, monitoring your initial heart rate ability to establish a baseline to determining your resonance frequency breathing rate so that you can do your training in the most ideal personalized way. Um, and then doing HRV by feedback training and combining that with mindfulness and self-compassion practice. Uh, so if all of that together in one app, you do need an HRV uh, reader. We are working on being able to take uh, the readings from the phone camera. That's coming soon. Okay. Not there yet. Uh, right now, you do need a reader. But any Bluetooth uh, uh, device that's open, you know, so a polar strap, you know, the, the M-Wave, you know, bio straps, uh, uh, you know, Corsens, you know, all, all of these. These uh, uh, readers that are capable of uh, uh, Bluetooth connection and are you know that are open um, will connect to the app and help people uh, do their training. If I was smarter, I would have your app already up. I just have my, you know my Steve Jobs stuff here, and I never know what this stuff means. Okay, because you know I'm I'm the mom and dad on the show. Heart rate variability, thirty two milliseconds. Is that good or bad? <laughs> That's an such an excellent question and such an excellent example of the trouble that we're in. So many devices will give you these numbers with zero explanation as to, you know, as to what that is, what that means, what to do with it. Um, absolutely. Right. So it, is that an Apple watch that's giving yeah, you yeah. the 32 Apple. milliseconds? Yeah. Okay. So the, the Apple watch is uh, you know, likely giving you an SDNN measurement yeah. um, set on deviation of normal to normal interval. Um, and 32 seconds, uh, it also depends on your age, right? Your HRV is very age dependent. Um, um, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> For 24, you have a little ways to go to increase that. Okay. If you're a little older than 24, I think you're I think you What if I'm double well. that? <laughs> you're doing well then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. HRV does decrease with age, sadly. All right. What if I'm 56? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would have to look up your norms specifically, okay. but I'm going to say you're pretty much where you need to be. Okay. So that, that that's great. All right. Um, but that's the thing. You need to know what to do with those numbers, right? You know, they're, yeah, you know, the yeah. whirring, the whoop, you know, all these, uh, you know, all these devices give you information without necessarily explaining uh, what it is that you're looking at or uh, what to do with it, which I think is another reason why we're not making better use of it because we're amassing tons of data. And I have no to say it. that, that it, as, as dumbed down as those numbers are, they tend to track uh, life experience pretty closely. Uh, uh, recently, we had uh, a, a death in in the immediate family here in the house. Uh, uh, my partner's mother passed, and for about a month or so before she passed, I mean, it was becoming uh, very difficult. And uh, it, it, HRV numbers for me dropped about twenty points, and and they stayed down for a period of time. And uh, quality of sleep, the uh, the HRV numbers, everything ended up reflecting uh, the strain of the stress. And uh, uh, you know, a lot of people point it, at it as stress, but it's actually strain. Um, you know, the stress is the the thing out there 
uh, that you're responding to stresses what you what you're doing uh, with respect to it. And um, the 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 stress showed itself in the HRV numbers again with about a twenty point drop, and um, and to a, a, a seriously concerning lower numbers for me. So um, you know, I I had to start doing uh, da- daily HRV deliberate you know, uh, practice to kind of counteract the, uh, the amount of stress so that I didn't show the strain. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, a few months, uh, since uh, she passed now and everything is back to normal levels, but, um, it, it, it's interesting to track, um, that as a number, as a reflection of kind of, you know, w- what's the, uh, stress level, uh, and am I suffering strain uh, from the stress that's surrounding me? And it, uh, um, it's astoundingly sensitive. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, ultimately, HRV is probably the best measurement we have of our ability to self-regulate in general and the best cue we have for, hey, there is something going on, right? Just like you described, Jay. Uh, I mean, you, you know, you knew what was what was going on. Um, but oftentimes people, you know, the first key, clue they have that, you know, there is something that needs to be paid attention to from their HRV uh, readings. And people can intervene a lot sooner. In your case, you know, you knew like, hey, this is really affecting me. I, I know I need to do something about it, right? You know, start yeah. using uh, HRV training a little bit more regularly. How amazing is that, right? You know, you, you know something is happening and uh, it tells you what you can do uh, about it. How great would it be if all of us could take that morning reading, uh, you know, three minutes, one, once a day in the morning, first thing you do, uh, really small time commitment. And it gives you so much information. You know, where am I for the day? Yeah. You know, is this a day when I take on a new challenge? Is this a day when I take it easy and rest? Yeah. And he has the watch. I have... Uh... Or a ring, ring. Mm-hmm. and an Apple Watch, you know, so <laughs> I can end up comparing technology to technology to make sure I've got validated numbers and everything. But uh, the things track really quite nicely. Um, um, it, uh, uh, and these aren't the only things. I mean, uh, there, there's uh, Fitbits, and pretty much everybody has caught on. Um, all of the athletic tracking devices out there. I saw that you and Santiago, who, uh, uh, given the time zone difference between Singapore and here, it's, I know, what's it, two in the morning or some darn time like that. Yeah. So uh, he's not with us, but you, the two of you did a, 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 a presentation together. And um, I, I, I think that's uh, extremely fruitful um, uh, uh, cross pollination. You know, I grew up in farm country in Fargo. So I use agricultural <laughs> analogies a lot, you know, uh, but uh, um, it, it, it it's really uh, positive to see the international presentations. It may have spun out of Russia, but it didn't like trickle through Europe to get here. Um, and it had to bounce back to Europe and down to South America and over to Asia. So uh, at this point, uh, there, there really isn't anywhere that's missing the fundamental information about it. Now, the high level science of it is still very, very high level science. Uh, I I have to say, um, the uh, spectral analysis, uh, uh, tracking sympathetic, parasympathetic aspects of it with high frequency, low frequency content, things like that are beyond just the count your breathing time in and out. uh, but the, the the depth of science and knowledge that's available from it uh, is uh, huge and, and largely still untapped. Turn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neurosciences NeuroGuide workshops in Madeira Beach, Florida. They're led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person, with the link appliedneuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops earn up to 16 ceu hours sign up now at applied neuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops so so the drugs that are being taken out there let's just go through a couple here let's say xanax and uh pick your beta blocker or whatever if you did the hrv now i'm not going to hold anybody to any numbers but could you give us a guess on what you think 
instead of taking uh blood pressure medication or you know uh mood stabilizers what percentage do you think if we did hrv we wouldn't have to take that i know you're taking a lot of people but 10 percent, 20 percent. what 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 do you think I think depends on the drug, but I would could replace a lot of Xanax use uh, yeah. with HRV, with consistent HRV training. I don't know, maybe 50, 60 percent, maybe more, um, you know, and the drugs like Xanax actually lower your heart variability. So they actually are not so yeah. good for you uh, in lots of ways, um, you know, psychologically, physiologically. So not great. Um, you know, beta blockers, you know, and, you know, under uh, medication for high blood pressure, you know, those are often, you know, necessary for um, other reasons. So, you know, it's oh, really we're not telling not anybody not to take their <laughs> blood pressure medicine. <laughs> right, right. So we, would, we do want to be careful with that. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, so often, uh, if you add HRV training to blood pressure medication, uh, your blood pressure is going to stabilize uh, sooner, you may not need as much medication. Uh, and so many folks out there, they're taking the medication, but their blood pressure is not actually adequately controlled. Um, and adding uh, HRV training to that will enable them uh, to uh, get much closer or perhaps you know, get their uh, blood pressure under control. Um, you know, people who are taking uh, beta blockers for uh, speaking anxiety, right? Uh, that we can probably eliminate altogether uh, with uh, HRV and mindfulness training. Uh, people do have to invest time and emotional energy into that, uh, but we could probably uh, you know, get 90% of folks uh, off of these uh, uh, medications with that kind of anxiety. Yeah. And most of the sleeping medications damage the architecture of sleep, uh, which is, I think, kind of the unsaid statement when people medicate for sleep. Um, uh, and they don't ben work. They don't work long term, right? Yeah. After three months, they give no benefit. Yeah. Uh, benzodiazepines are REM suppressors. If you want to end up having a lack of memory consolidation, stop your REM at night. You know, uh, um, uh, you, you really can't take that kind of a drug long term without damaging your sleep and having a really awful dependency. Uh, it, it, as you take benzodiazepines, your body replicates GABA receptors, which are kind of the target. And if you have more receptors, it's harder to saturate them. So your your anxiety arousal level is is increasing, and you have to increase your dose if you're going to have that as your solution. And that's never that's not a solution. Uh, that that's a it's a guaranteed problem. And and getting off of benzodiazepines, if you become really extremely physiologically dependent on it, is very difficult. Uh, at, at the state hospital where I worked, uh, we, we had people come in for medical detox off of benzos. And, you know, you can see them walk down the hall, fall to the floor, convulse. You know, you're, 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 you've stopped taking something that suppresses the level of activation and, and your brain re rebounds into a higher level of, of agitation activation. So they fall down, they convulse, they get up, dust themselves off, and you say, John, you just fell to the ground and had a seizure. How are you? He says, I didn't fall to the ground and have a seizure. They, they have no, no recollection of the event at all. And it, it, it's... It's totally destroyed their ability to function in society at that point. And you know, uh, uh, as one of the people told me, addiction takes all the fun out of the drugs. So, uh, yeah, and it, uh, um, what what started as uh, something that they kind of enjoyed ends up being something that they're searching for in order to feel halfway okay. And there's no more, you know, enjoyment or, you know, uh, fun uh, le left in it. But the psychiatrists, when people come in, I'm under the impression they say, hey, why don't you give this a try versus they'll, they'll just write the script. Here you go. It's supposed to be a short term thing, but they're taking it for years and they're not offering the HRV first. It's almost like you got to. Try this first. See if it does anything for you. 
And then, of it's, course, they'll go back home and they won't try it. And they'll come back. Yeah, I tried it. didn't work. Give me the script. How, how do you get past that? Well, I think, you know, right now, HRV is the last resort, not the first resort. Yeah. So many people come yeah. to me. Uh, you know, I've tried 50 things. <clears throat> and now I'm here because none of those 50 things worked well enough. So I'm desperate. You know, I'm desperate enough to try this. I think that's already part of the problem is that we are, the you know, we're the last resort, not first, which is where we, you know, should be. Um, and then there is the the time and effort and the habit uh, change that needs to happen. And it's just plain hard, right? You know, this is not... Um, it, that's the reality. It, you know, it's so much easier to take a pill. And this is not a judgment, right? You know, hey, you know, hard for me too, right? You know, it's so hard to get into that mm -hmm. um, habit of, you know, taking your reading in the morning, doing your 20 minutes of HRV training, you know, at some point during the day. Uh, it's hard to find time. It's hard to remember. You know, it's hard to set aside other things because we have, you know, 50 million things that are competing. No question, it's hard. And taking a pill takes a second. And you think that's that's that, right? So the, the, that competing, you know, immediate gratification, like I can take a pill right now and not have to worry about this for the rest of the day. There's it's so tempting. So it really has to start with, I think, what you were talking about earlier, Pete, getting people into that habit when when they're so much younger. Then, you know, by the time they get to be adults with, you know, 50 million competing things, yeah. this is already part of what they're doing. And it. Like we said, it's a short term thing. And is this a contributing to dementia, Alzheimer's? You know, if you're on benzos for a long period of time, I don't know. I, I've heard I've heard it is. So in if you're gonna study to be a psychologist or psychiatrist, you know, you're the Harvard person, okay? I'm the Southern Illinois person, he's a North Dakota state person. Do they teach this in the schools you know if you want to be a psychologist should it be one of the one of the mandatory courses i don't know if it is or it isn't do they teach it well this is where i learned it but as i said it was an optional course that not not everybody had to take um and uh, it's uh, yes it's available but not nearly um widely enough um and not enough uh, people end up having access so if we know it works <laughs> it should be done and if you're learning to be a psychologist, they don't make you learn it. I'm scratching my head. How, how does that get fixed? <laughs> Even within the field of psychology, most most therapists, I don't honestly don't know the numbers, but I'm going to guess at least 80 percent have no have no idea. Uh, this is because this is not being taught. And it how should do, be. Jay, how do we? That's how we started this podcast. You know, we're trying to spread the the word. He's mm -hmm. Jay's been trying to spread the word since the early seventies, and you know, I just got in this you know four years ago. How obviously, we... obviously, I'm terribly inefficient at spreading the word. <laughs> <laughs> but with this podcast, you're picking up speed, my friend. Well, there you go. I mean, that that's how you do it, right? Little, you know, little by little by little. Uh, uh, over time, you get you get the word out. Uh, that's what we need to do. Well, the government needs to get into this and, oh God, politics and government, it, all this data that's being generated, it's in all these silos. It'd be nice if there was an open source or something where it all got de deposited in there and you could take advantage of it. We've had a lot of people on the show and a lot of people are doing the same things. And it'd be nice if you could... Uh, you know, like the internet got created, you know, connecting people, okay? When you have two computers connected, it's not as valuable as four computers connected, right? Four, 16, 32. If, if we could have some, everybody is on the same page and says, okay, this is what we need to do. Is the government the only one that could make this happen, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Probably not. Uh <laughs> But, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are other ways. You know, one, one thing actually that's happening right now in California, you know, is the um, the massive uh, effort to get the ACES, you know, survey out and the you know, interventions, you know, out to kids yeah. uh, much earlier. Right. So that's uh, one way that we can get HRV uh, interventions, you know, as, as part of that. I don't think it is, but there, you know, uh, from what I understand, there has been a lot of funding, you know, uh, funneled uh, to that. So, you know, getting 
um, heart variability training as part of that intervention would go such a long way. And then, you know, other states will often model themselves on California, right? And, uh, you know, uh, getting that into into every state, that could be a great way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and, and the ACEs testing is essentially like a diagnosis. Uh, you know, you've, you've got a, a problem that there's a solution to match up with it. And, and it's not one where you have to go off somewhere for surgery or anything like that. I mean, this is, um, you know, uh, start them early in school and uh, add in HRV as a, and, and mindfulness together as a, as a, a set of techniques. And you're going to see a lot less uh, interpersonal uh, uh, difficulties in schools. Um, you, you, you see the kids wind down by using this. And you know if they're not all wound up by the time they have to go out for you know playground, uh, there's fewer fights on the playground, and uh, so fewer kids expelled, and yeah, you know, the, uh, the the entire school system is is going to have a huge benefit. Yeah. So it's it, it it's something that needs to be instituted at, at a grade school preschool level and uh, worked into the curriculum solidly. That. It's nice to see some universities having mind-body medicine or mind-body studies or uh, psychophysiology, if they want to get a little bit fancier with their terminology. But uh, it, it's good to see some of that uh, percolating up in university coursework. And, um, you know, uh, um, at, at one point, uh, Richard Sherman um, had his uh, uh, mind body coursework as a PhD, uh, but he needed to have it in an accredited university. And he would, he had paired up with a university in New Mexico who was going through their, um, uh, evaluation for uh, being accredited uh, on the assumption that they would become accredited. And that when that fell through, uh, they needed to find a university to host them. And uh, he asked me to sit on their board to help look for a, a, a host university. And I, I happen to have already interacted with Saybrook in a totally different area. Uh, they have some work on uh, um, essentially institutional, um, uh, like business end of things. And um, I, I was enough of a gadfly with the refinery here in the Bay area that uh, they, I asked them to uh, put some money into Saybrook to, to fund some institutional organizational uh, uh, research that they were doing. And so I had gotten them a grant for quite a few thousand dollars. And so they, they kind of knew me. Um, and I, I called the president of the university, asked him to lunch uh, and, you know, free lunches. <laughs> um, I gave him a spreadsheet and uh, and said, you know, look it over. If, if it looks favorable, we've got an entire PhD program that your university could host. Um, and you know, all the lecturers and everything, all the courses are APA accredited already and ready to roll. He looked it over and said, geez, Jay, this looks great. Um, we're in the midst of our uh, accreditation review, Western, you know, accreditation. And, uh, as soon as that's done, we'll add this in, and, um, that it'll be evaluated on our next go around. And it, uh, when they picked it up, basically it's worked so well that this is now a core part of Saybrook and it, it draws good students to Saybrook and, um, uh, but other, other universities obviously as well, uh, the, uh, it's, important uh, to have uh, something other than academics about academics, academics about mind and brain and, and interactions, mind, body medicine, um, uh, that this, this makes it uh, physiologic and personal in a way that uh, academic studies just don't. And uh, I, I tell you, the students are really a wonderful uh, group too. They're extremely motivated and uh, uh, very bright. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think uh, some of them are going to end up shining in the future uh, as stars within the field. 
um, do, uh, the, everybody has to start somewhere, but it looks like they're starting kind of a notch up from the, anywhere I started. That's for sure. What budget do you need to do HRV? Um, actually, not that much. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you do need, you know, ideally you do need some devices, but again, you know, uh, with, with limited budget, you can get devices that are way less expensive than, you know, the FDA approved, you know, big right. scale, um, uh, big scale ones. You, you can operate on a, you know, probably a few thousand dollars budget. In the school systems, I mean, just learning how to breathe, like you said, at the bare bones exactly. could be zero. If you want to and take that could be next, zero. and you want to, and if you want to scale and measure the results, yeah, a couple bucks compared to, you know, the insurance companies, they won't cover HRV, will they? Um, some do, uh, but most don't. Um, and again, it does not make any sense because the amount of savings that would provide them just from that purely financial standpoint, yeah. it would just really make sense. Look at the long-term outcome from an ACEs score greater than four. What's the insurance company's cost for all of that later life hypertension, heart problems, depression, you know, uh, suicidality. I mean, the the uh, the early intervention to avoid the eventuality of a bad ACEs score. No, I, I took the ACEs test. I got a zero. I feel guilty. You know, so uh, the one of the few things that has ever made me feel guilty. You know, so uh, um, but you know, I, um, I I've always done what I've been able to to help students in part because of guilt. I had a really uh, wonderful upbringing and could do whatever I wanted to because my family was well to do. And um, at at university, if I wanted to uh, do a project or take a course or do a weekend uh, uh, trip with other students or something, it was something I could do easily. Uh, uh, no, no problem. Uh, um, but I see students out there, uh, they don't have money for their food even. You know? So uh, I, I, I've done, always done what I could to try and help students. And, uh, and you know, I'm a sucker for a student. $17,000 in auctioning off shaving my beard. That's <laughs> I mean, right. That's always a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to say, it's a little bit nutty. But then a little bit nutty and me kind of go together, okay, you know. Um, uh, when I did it on Australia, I have to say, I got quite a few uh, uh, scant looks when I proposed, you know, people, uh, you know, bidding for the rights to shave my beard. But that, that auction took off. You know, $5,000 later, their student fund ended up with a, a, a bump up in $5,000 that they hadn't seen in a long time. Um you know, and what's really crazy, they pasted what they shaved off of me onto one of those wig heads that they measure for EGs, you know. So this wig head had that rattiest beard and mustache pasted on it. The next year they auctioned that for five hundred dollars. <laughs> and I I'm thinking you should burn it, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but oh well, no accounting for taste, obviously. But um <laughs> I always describe it as a low overhead donation. <laughs> so, uh, Doctor uh, has another strategy, maybe um, role models, professional athletes, peak performance that they they use HRV, don't they? Um. Yes, uh, I think uh, there is not enough talk about it. Yeah. Uh, there is, uh, again, you know, a lot of athletes use, uh, you know, the whoop and, you know, the aura ring and things like that, but not a ton of understanding of what those numbers mean and exactly what to do with them. Um, and none of none of these provide um, HRV training, right? You know, knowledge about HRV is one thing, uh, and there is definitely not enough of that, uh, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of people who use uh, HRV do so with very scant understanding of what exactly uh, is being measured and what this information tells them. Um, but this idea that you can actually train your HRV to improve performance um, is even you know way behind the eight ball, right? Yeah, that. And a lot of these apps and devices just don't even offer that. 
Because there's the NFL combine that's usually in March or April of the year. So you have everybody goes to Indianapolis and they, the athletes show their, their wares. They run a 40 yard dash, they do a bench press and they train for this event so they can peak at that p- p- particular time. Cause if they get good numbers and they will rise in stock and get drafted higher and make, make more money. How would HRV help them in the training up to that event? I know it could be a simple answer, but with all the stress, but it it should help their physical performance, right? Absolutely. I mean, we know that um, HRV helps with physical endurance, right? You know, you can simply run longer or run faster or both. Right. You know, it, 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 HRV is all about helping your um, nervous system regulate itself. Right. And what do you need for optimal performance and optimally regulated nervous system? So, so there is a direct relationship between training your heart durability uh, and seeing an improvement in performance. And, you know, research very much shows that. Um, and so it's it's both uh, helping regulate, um, you know, s- uh, you know, stress and anxiety and that physiological activation pre-performance and the ability of the nervous system to actually be at its best. You know, with, with these high level athletes, their physical abilities are pushed to the very edge. Right. You know, the difference between, uh, you know, being elite and just below that is incremental, tiny, tiny. Right. Um, and uh, HRV training get, can give people exactly that edge you know, to get over that tiny, tiny hump yeah. uh, and ultimately make a huge difference. The percentage of the population that gets to be an elite athlete is very small. But the percentage of, of people that become astronauts or cosmonauts is even smaller. And HRV was developed in the Soviet Union specifically for their space program. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not for sending a monkey into space. It's for people. And, um, you know, if it was that critical that they spent that much science time developing it, uh, for their cosmonauts, don't, you know, it's got a huge value in other elite athlete circumstances and the, the the precise benefit may not be as well identified as it was for the cosmonauts but it's there and uh, it you know the, it, it needs to be picked up if at the combine they actually measure the hrv on the athletes uh, they may have a piece of information that would end up ranking somebody a little higher or a little lower uh, on their rankings, it'd be a good thing to add in on the evaluation, and I, um, you know, it, it, that's that's a small little thing because they they're always trying to figure out yeah how yeah, how to test uh, and rank uh, differentially, and uh, it, it, it's an objective measure, and I, I think it could be added in very readily. Probably yeah. should be. Let's, yeah. throw, let's throw in another uh, mo- role model, if you want to call it that. Uh, m- musicians, you know, rock stars, you know, you you get the rush performing on the stage. And then when you're done, you can't go to sleep. So you take something to go. Right. And and you regulate yourself that way. I mean, that's got to help. Right. Well, that's what's available. Right. That's what <laughs> people know about. Yeah. Doctor, doctor, you have a new book out, uh, Heartbeat for Business. Tell me about that. I'm all about business. <laughs> what is it yeah, about? So, um, so the book is uh, about uh, optimizing performance for uh, business leaders, uh, business professionals, uh, you know, team leaders. Um, how can you use um, heart rate variability and training and heart rate variability biofeedback to improve your performance and your team performance. What does HRV tell you about your team? What does HRV tell you about how to improve things? Um, and kind of the book is built around that, but of course it also has strategies um, that are not directly re- related to HRV, but in kind of optimizing your team uh, team performance and your own leadership. That is very cool. The companies get it in that way. Cause I mean, they spent all this money on, on training, especially salespeople, sales enablement, getting the right mindset to be able to communicate with people. Uh, do, do you get a lot of companies bringing you in? I know you're, you know, TED Talks, everybody sees you, but uh, are, are you getting uh, some open doors into uh, corporations? 
Um, yeah, uh, more, more and more so. Um, you know, the, the, this was a kind of corporate training was on the upswing and then COVID hit and then it was all online. It's, you know, but now we actually have so much better ways of measuring HRV remotely. Um, and now this is kind of all coming back in a, in a kind of hybrid model where we can do remote monitoring training, where we can do uh, stuff in person. Uh, but yeah, uh, absolutely. That's a big part of what I do. Who are you helping at the companies? Like, are you going through human resources? Or are you going through the sales team? Like, it, I, it I'm very curious. It, it depends. Uh, it depends on the company. Sometimes it's, uh, uh, oftentimes it's uh, their uh, kind of internal education uh, department uh, and uh, some you know, wellness uh, officers. Wellness. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it can be um, HR, although so I think less so. Uh, it, it's often uh, wellness uh, and it's often, you know, people who are working with the leaders. Uh, so oftentimes this is kind of how it gets propagated. You know, we're training the leaders who are then uh, uh, making changes changes in how they're interacting with their teams uh, uh, and it you know, kind of propagates uh, top down that way. Makes sense. People don't quit companies. They quit their leader. That's right. Good, that's, that's, right. A good, that's a good business to be in. Dr. Kazan, thank you so much for coming on the Neuro Noodle podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This was a fabulous discussion. The Neuro Noodle podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you. Like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience, and our silver supporter, Mind Media. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neuroscience's NeuroGuide workshops. In Madeira Beach, Florida, they're led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person, with the link AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops earn up to 16 ceu hours sign up now at appliedneuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops mind media get the latest eeg and neurofeedback technology from mindmedia.com their semi-dry sensor caps is a wonder to see and their eeg amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades their neurofeedback and QEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit mindmedia.com now.